Hi there, everybody. Hi, guys. How are we all doing today? Out there. Maybe one day we'll hear back like, yeah, yeah I know, yeah, great. yeah, I know. I guess I could do this. Wait, wait a second. Wait a second. Here we go. Here we go. Hi, everybody. How you doing? <laughs> How goofy are we? So, I, I know people probably saw my comments about I had a few technical problems a few minutes ago. But we overcame those, so I didn't actually have to bail out and start over again. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. So we're all gathering right now yep. on this uh, turns kind of sometimes sunny, sometimes cloudy. The clouds will be in and out, which will affect us a little bit here in our studio, oh, yes. <laughs> where, from which we broadcast online across America and the world. And the world. And the world, yeah. indeed. Oh, and the, the world. world wide web. Yes. <laughs> the world wide web. So what's new, Patty? Not not too, too much. It's a nice day. Um, nice day out. I'm really glad the winds calmed down from yesterday. That was mm. crazy. And I don't know about you guys. Our rain gauge broke, first of all. It, well, I've we gone through two of puppy. them already since the beginning of the year. Like the glass cylinder part, it has either rained so hard or whatever that the bottom has just broken out on two of them. So we can't tell how much rain we've gotten. Well, but we got a good bit yesterday, oh last gosh. night. Yes. Yeah. And what was it, Friday night into Saturday? Was that? I guess. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So we had a good. lot of rain. So All well, our plants good. are happy. They are very happy. Grass is happy. You know what that means? What does that mean? The guy is going to start cutting the lawn again every week. Well, as long as it doesn't <laughs> more during class, I'm okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? You get this little reprieve. Of like not having to pay to get your lawn cut ah, there for that, quite a few, yes. well, quite a few months, and then gotta pay the piper, honey. Yes, that's right. Because it gotta looks pay so the nice. Piper. Everybody's lawn looks nice when yes. it's green. So, so, what do you think? What do you think? I'm thinking we maybe should go ahead and start. Do you think? Let's see. Okay, we've given people just a few minutes here. Yeah, what time is it? Three o three. Three o three. That's not a lot of bantering. That's not a lot of bantering. No. No, we we're we're banter <laughs> short today. <laughs> So whatever, what else is on your mind? Let's see what else is on my mind. Well, this is a really busy week for everybody. I think the only day that I personally will not be at St. Andrew is Wednesday. Okay. I'll be there Wednesday. Um, Got a meeting. Of course, we'll be there tomorrow and um, uh, Monday, Thursday and Good Friday. And we're going to try going to the 530 in the sanctuary service on Saturday. Um of course, it's something we've never done before. Just we've never, never have, not been never to work. church on Easter Sunday, and we'll we'll just see how it works. Hopefully, it's it's going to work out really well, and I've got the whole family on board, so we'll be saving a couple parking spots, right, for right. people on Sunday, and also less less of us in the in the row. Yeah. So, so I think that that will be good, and uh, we'll probably get to see the little kids do the Easter egg hunt as long as it's sunny out that day, because right. they do it right after that right service. After. So that's always kind of fun. Um, that's really about it. I know Easter's coming because weeks ago I bought this back package of like um, in Kroger, like the little individually packaged jelly beans with about 10 jelly beans in each one. And I only have two packages left. And what happened to the other eight, dear? <laughs> oh, there was more than eight and I've eaten them all. <laughs> <laughs> I've eaten them all. Okay. I love jelly beans. You know, what can I say? You and Ronald Reagan. I know. Yeah. I, hey, someday I will tell my Ronald Reagan jelly bean story. You will. Yeah. That, that's a Really, hoot. it's a good story. So anyway, okay. I guess we're ready. We, we bantered enough? We bantered. Okay, let's pray then. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be here today. And uh, we're grateful for the rain that we're getting. We know we're going to need it as the, as the year moves along. And we are grateful that we have the chance to come together like this and return to Paul's letter, 2 Corinthians. And there's a lot of, a lot of meaty stuff today mm -hmm. in uh, what he writes for us and, and to the Corinthians. And we just pray that your Holy Spirit will indeed, um, as Paul puts it, remove the veil from our hearts and our minds so that we can see and hear the good news of Christ clearly. Wow. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I guess Amen. that is kind of like another way of saying remove the scales from our eyes. Another, but it's tied to, to, the, to a story of Moses that we're going to talk about today. So, all right, friends, here we go. 
So we are in the second chapter. We could have we, we essentially finished the second chapter last last week, but you know me, I like to uh, kind of lead into to it. So I think where I want to begin is um, maybe Second Corinthians chapter two, verse. 14 okay so if we could all find that that'll be a that'd be a good good lead-in because really what's going to happen is in the letter in chapter 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 uh, Paul is building an argument around the new covenant and new creation and how to understand what he is doing in and amongst the Corinthians, what 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 God's what God's way is, what His ministry really is, and hence what it is not. So, because remember, He has a lot of problems with the Corinthians and um, some rivals. I think I would put it that way for the hearts and minds of the Corinthians. And Paul is quite sure that they are leading the Corinthians in the wrong way. So. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, <coughs> verse 14. But thanks be to God, who always leads us as, as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma, we talked about that last week, the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved, and those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death. That would be the aroma to the perishing, the ones who are ignoring the good news and saying no. To the other, an aroma that brings life, and that is the contrast that Paul will constantly be focused on death and life Darkness and light for Paul, as in the rest of the New Testament, there is no middle ground. You are in the darkness until you come into the light. It's death or life. That, that's the choices. There's no, there's no sitting on the fence or sitting in the middle of the road. I think Paul would say, if you sit in the middle of the road, you just get run over. No, you are. You, you are either with Jesus or not with Jesus. So, at the end of 16, he asks sort of the big question. Who is equal to such a task? This tax of being a minister of life to these Christians, to these new believers. And um, it's a good question. It's the question every preacher today should ask themselves. Who is equal to such a task? I mean, I, I preached every Sunday for 10 years, and the question would often cross my mind, well, who am I to be doing this? Really? You're, you're telling people the good news of Jesus Christ, and you hope that God uses you as a vehicle or a vessel for that, but really, as Paul writes at the end of verse 16, who is equal to such a task? Verse 17, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. Um, in my Tuesday class, we're not quite there, but we will soon be at chapter 9 where where Saul, the Pharisee, is visited by Jesus and, and takes on a vocation from Jesus to be this bearer of the good news to the Gentile world as the Apostle, as the apostle Paul. Um, but clearly here in verse 17, Paul is differentiating himself from other people who have come into this community that are peddling the word of God for a prophet. And, I, you know, it's funny. Just the other day, Patty and I watched much of the movie Leap of Faith with Steve Martin. So funny. I just wrote that down. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, Leap of Faith. And where he plays a traveling evangelist, and it's basically a business 
for him and you know and he doesn't really even know what to do when he's confronted that with the fact that there may be more but Paul in any event unlike verse 17 unlike so many we do not peddle the word of God for profit on the contrary in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God okay So let's go then right on into chapter 3. And he says an, another question. He's, this is really the response. He's carrying this conversation um, on with himself, right? Because he's writing this letter to the Corinthians. Are we, is this Paul, am I beginning to commend myself again? Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Is this, is this me just telling you this? Is it me just talking about this, right? He says, or do we need... Like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you. You know, a little letter saying, oh yes, Paul is the right guy, he is the good guy, he speaks the truth. Paul carries this letter of recommendation around and shows it to people and, and they, they then listen to him and, you know, drop their money in the love buckets or whatever mm -hmm. they call evangelists today will sometimes call them. And look what he says in verse 2 to the Corinthians. He says, you yourselves are our letter. Written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. It is the Christians themselves who are Paul's letters of recommendation. He doesn't need words written by somebody else. These Christians, they bear the truth to the good news that Paul is bringing to them. Verse 3, you show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Let me read that again. Written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. So I want to show you a couple of Old Testament passages that um, Paul is calling upon when he is writing this. And one of them, if you would turn to Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 14. And I'm going to do the same thing. I've got this. Ezekiel 11, verse 14. You got it there. Okay, so Ezekiel was a prophet of God um, in and around the time of the Babylonian exile. And he brought God's word to the people and there were many words of the trouble that was coming, but there were also words of hope and return from exile. So look, just look at, we'll just read this. It, it reads pretty plainly. Ezekiel 11, verse 14. The word of the Lord came to me, that is Ezekiel, son of man, the people of Jerusalem have said of your fellow exiles and all the other Israelites, oh, they are far away from Yahweh. This land was given to us as our possession. Therefore, this is God speaking to Ezekiel, say, This is what the sovereign Yahweh says, King Yahweh. Although I sent them far away among the nations and scattered them among the countries, yet for a little while I have been a sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. Because you see, maybe 150 years before Ezekiel, 
the Assyrians overran the ten northern tribes and they were scattered. They became the lost tribes of Israel. But just because there were, from that point on, Jewish communities in a lot of far-flung places, it doesn't mean they were abandoned by God. God still gave them sanctuary in these countries. Verse 17. Therefore say, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will gather you from the nations, and I will bring you back from the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you back the land of Israel again. They will return to it and remove all its vile images and detestable idols, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their hearts of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts are devoted to their vile images and detestable idols, I will bring down on their own heads what they have done, declares the Sovereign Lord. Right? Their sins will turn upon, will be turned upon themselves. That's... Everything has consequences. Now look at verse 22. We're going to go on just a little bit here because I have a point I want to make. Then the cherubim, these are the winged guardians. These are winged creatures, the guardians in this vision. Then the cherubim with the wheels beside them spread their wings and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. And the glory of the Lord went up from within the city, that's Jerusalem, and stopped above the mountain east of it. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the exiles in Babylonia in the vision given by the Spirit of God. Then the vision I had seen went up from me, and I told the exiles everything Yahweh had shown me. It is this moment in Ezekiel's visions when the glory of God departs Jerusalem and heads eastward, departs the temple, and heads eastward. And I bring it up because for Paul, in Christ now, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, has returned. Except that the dwelling place is not a marble temple anymore. Now the temple is the church, 1 Corinthians. The temple is each individual believer, 1 Corinthians. And, and this is this vision of, of, of the glory of God leaving Jerusalem, leaving the temple, and heading eastward. But this business about the hearts of stone and hearts of flesh, those are, that's a big, that's a big moment. But an even more famous one is in Jeremiah. So turn to Jeremiah. I've got to get myself more light here. <laughs> well, the sun keeps going in and yeah, out. Yeah, I know. Turn to Jeremiah 31. These are just, these, you know, there are certain passages in the Bible that are really touchstones. They're really ones that you just need to know. You need to know where they are. You don't, I, you know, you don't have to memorize them, but you should know Jeremiah 31. Wow. Jeremiah 31, 31. Oh, Scott, come on. 31, 31? 31, 31. That makes it a little easier to remember, I guess, it right? It does. Well, Scott, can I ask you about that last one, uh -huh. Ezekiel? When Ezekiel preached that message, where did the people think then the Spirit of God was going? Did they think it was no longer with them? Well, the, yeah, you ahead? see that, 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 that the glory of God had departed eastward in the vision. Yes. Which answers the question, how could the Babylonians tear down the temple of the Lord if God is actually present in the temple, right? right? Because God is God and the Babylonians are not. So, but if God has left the temple and headed eastward, the glory of the Lord is headed eastward, it does, I think, answer that question. Well, that's how they 
were able to destroy the temple because God wasn't in it anymore. And the question is, when does the Spirit of God truly return? And for Paul, it is with Pentecost. It is in Christ. It is, And it's not returning to a temple of marble, but instead the church and, and dwelling in each individual believer. Those are where the Spirit of God dwells, not the marble edifice in Jerusalem. Okay, so Jeremiah 31, 31, little Old Testament tour today, huh? Yeah. 31, 31. The days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. Why, do you, why is it called your Bible divided between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Well, the coming of Jesus. Yeah, but the old writings of the Old Covenant and the writings of the, the new, new Covenant. covenant. A, a testament's gotcha. a covenant. Mm -hmm. So, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. There's that glorious husband and wife metaphor that uh, I talk about a lot, declares the Yahweh. Verse 33, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares Yahweh, I will put my law, his teachings, his instruction, his law, in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares Yahweh. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Wow. Famous, famous passage. Very much pointing you to the New Testament, to Jesus, to the new covenant, to the new exodus in, in Jesus. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. Or to use, to, use, to use Ezekiel's twist, not the law won't be written on tablets of stone. It'll be written on their hearts. You see? I will be their God. They will be my people. It's just, it's just great. And to go on about this for a second, it, these are the promises that the people, Jews of Jesus' day, were waiting to be fulfilled. That's what, made, that's what made things so tense at times, is that for hundreds of years, these promises, in truth, went unfulfilled. And they were waiting for God to raise up a Messiah who would fulfill them. And, you know, Paul's teaching is that God did, indeed, that that Messiah is Jesus. And these promises have been fulfilled already and, to use Paul's other perspective, not yet. So, anyway, okay. So go back to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 3. Verse, well... Verse 1. Verse 3. So, any thoughts about that, Patty? I know we're not all in the same room where this would probably right. generate some discussion, but anything, anybody? Nope. 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 Please feel free to just write any <laughs> comments or questions you have. Honestly, Scott loves that. I know. He, right? I you do. do. You I love, can't help it. You love um, delving deeper sometimes. Yeah. So, he says to the Corinthians, okay, I don't need a letter of reference. Verse 3, you show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry. That's Paul's ministry. Written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human heart. Paul's a Pharisee. He knows the scriptures inside and out. So, of course, you find constant 
quotations, allusions, echoes of the Hebrew scriptures in the writings of Paul because Jesus is the fulfillment of what came before. So, verse 4, Paul writes, Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Such confidence we have. We should all be confident through Christ before God. Paul is confident. We should be confident. Easter is about the resurrection of Jesus. It is the proof that Jesus was who he claimed to be. It is the proof that Jesus is who Paul claims him to be. And we who are Easter people should be confident in our faith, confident through Christ before God. We, we know that we stand before God reconciled to God by Jesus. That's the good, that's the essence of the good news. And you may say to yourself, well, I don't feel like it, and I'm a mess, and I'm this, and I'm that. Well, we could talk about that. Maybe about like doing a little better, maybe, but still, you stand before God through Christ. Through Christ. And you can do it through Christ confidently. You don't have to cower and shrink away. Not because of what you've done or haven't done, but because of what Christ has done for you. That's Look at the sentence. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. It's about God, God, God. We are confident through Christ before God. We, Paul is confident in his basic competency as an apostle. Why? Because he is a Pharisee, because he's educated, because he can write powerfully, because he is... No, none of that. None of that. His competence comes from God. It has, it begins and it ends with God. And he is facing opponents, not just in Corinth, but elsewhere, who come with all the stuff the Greek people like. Big, fancy language. Big, flowery eloquence. Lots of show. They all look the part. You know, they sound the part and the rest of it. And Paul says, no. Sweep all that away. The Greeks valued what was called rhetoric. Being able to persuade people to your point and all of the, the learning that went around being a good um, student of rhetoric Paul, sweep it away, Paul says. Just sweep it away. Our competence comes from God. Verse 6. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter but of the Spirit, for the letter kills. And here he is, what letter is he talking about? Yes. He is talking about the Old Testament law. He is a Pharisee, after all. And think about the contrast. What was the contrast in Ezekiel about? Not tablets of stone, right? Like in the Exodus, like in the movie. What does Moses come down from the mountain with? Tablets of what? Stone. Stone. Not tablets of stone, but now tablets written on the human heart. Okay, I do have. To, you're gonna have to yeah, explain Yeah, fine, because this is very this a Not little of the letter, little but dense. of the spirit. For yes. the letter kills, but when Jesus comes, He says, "I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it." 
So I am a little bit, you know, that we're, when we're talking about the law being the letter kills it, but the spirit gives life. Um, what am I not seeing in connecting those two? You're 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 just you're, you're reading too much into what Jesus says, in the sense that that the law of Moses was good, and Jesus is the fulfillment of it. He is the high priest, such that no other priests are needed. He is the ultimate sacrifice, such that no other sacrifices are needed. He is the essence of love, loving God, loving neighbor. All that stuff was, was the law of Moses. And so Paul will say, well, the law was good, but it kills in the sense that the people were unable to keep it. Okay. And thus, they perished. And they would have kept on perishing, unreconciled to God, because, except that God did what? God took on human flesh. God provided a Jew who would be able to be faithful to the law in every way. And thus, in Christ, in the Spirit, of Christ. Let me put that those two words in the end if you want. In the spirit that that is where life is. We it's been demonstrated that life does not can't come from the law of Moses. But that doesn't mean it was like you remember Galatians Patty when when Paul makes talks a lot about the nanny. Yeah, the, I was just going to say yeah. to you is that have the same sort of thing that I you mean the law the was nanny. was like the nanny. Yes. I mean when you're young when you're little you need a nanny. Yes. But, but you outgrow the nanny. Right. 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 So that's so, kind of what this is. Yeah. So it's it's all what he is gonna do here shortly is to draw this big contrast between what was in the law of Moses and what is now in Christ. Okay. It's that contrast. So he's setting up that contrast. And of course, Jeremiah does that. Right? A new covenant, right. old covenant, new covenant, um, tablets of stone, um, tablets of human flesh, the law written on stone, the law written on our hearts. It's this contrast between the old and the new. It is why our Bibles are called an Old Testament and a New Testament. You know, our, our Jewish friends don't call the Hebrew Scriptures the Old Testament because they don't embrace any New Testament or New Covenant. They're still waiting for Jeremiah 31, 31 to be fulfilled. Right? Yes. But we Christians proclaimed to the world, well, the promises of Jeremiah have been fulfilled in Jesus. And all, all you need do to avail yourself of it is just is just let this gift from God just pour over you in gratefulness. That's that's it. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to learn any fancy stuff. You don't. Nope. Just just let God give you what God wants to give you, and not turn away, not run away. So. Good question, Patty, and it does it's, it sets things up. And it reminds us that because Paul works in metaphors so much, as any good teacher does, any all good teachers work in metaphors a lot and analogies because that's how we learn. We, we know A, how am I going to teach him B? Well, i got to start with A and then lead him into B. And so... Um, when I, I taught people to fly jet airplanes. How do you do that? Well, you start with basic maneuvers and pieces of, and you take those basic maneuvers and pieces of maneuvers, and then you begin to construct them into something else. That's, I think that's kind of, what, kind of what metaphors and analogies do for us. It takes something we know and helps us get to something new. So, verse 7. Now, Paul writes, if the ministry that brought death, and what ministry do you think that is? Anybody? Anybody? 
<laughs> oh, it's only you and me here, Patty. Bueller, Bueller. Bueller. It's a ministry that brought death. That is the law of Moses. Okay. Okay? Because they couldn't keep it. Remember, um, I've taught it this way a few times. So that, I, I think that's what, you know, that has to be made clear. It's not that the law was so bad. The law was probably good. It's just that humans could not keep it. Think about it this way. The law was like a magnifying glass that focused on human sin. Yes. Nobody else in the world knew what the law was. Nobody else in the world had the, was given the Ten Commandments. It was only the people of God. Yes. So it's the difference between, for example, knowing you're just, ah, just kind of knowing you're driving too fast because you're beginning to feel unsafe, and knowing the speed limit is 60. Yes. Well, the world might know they're driving too fast, but only the Jews, only the Israelites were given the speed limit of 60. And they couldn't keep it. They couldn't keep it. That's why it brought death. And if the ministry that brought, and if it hadn't brought death, you wouldn't need Jesus. That's the larger point. Why did Jesus come? Is it just a nice idea? No. Is it just an example to us? No. It's because we will not love God and love others as we should. Right? Yes. The two great commandments. No, we don't do that. And hence, that unwillingness on our part keeps us separated from God. Life is found in God. And if you're separated from God, you can't be surprised by death. What does Paul say in Romans 6? The wages of sin is death. How do we know what sin is? Because we've been given the law. We know what sin is. The Jews carried, it was a burden in that way to be chosen by God because they couldn't plead ignorance. People used to like, I don't hear a phrase too much anymore, but you know, you just plead, I, I'm just pleading ignorance, ignorance of the law. That's how I, I don't want you to, you know, punish me for doing something wrong because I'm, I'm just ignorant of it, but they couldn't do that. They couldn't plead ignorance. God spelled out for them what they should do. If you find your enemy's oxen tied to a tree, you take it to them. That may sound stupid to you, since everybody would keep that darn oxen for themselves. You not That's not God's people. You're to take it to them. Take it to your enemy. Wow. Wow. So, Paul writes, now, now if the ministry that brought death which was engraved in letters on stone. Right? Okay, Patty? Yes. You're, 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 you're standing in for everybody. Okay. Came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory. I better stop reading and show you where the story is. Okay, so we we you know we need to we need to find a story the right story here and read through it so we'll understand what Paul's doing here. If you don't if you don't know your Old Testament as many Christians don't, lots of parts of the New Testament just are impossible to understand. So turn to Exodus now. This is quite the Old Testament day today, isn't it, Patty? Turn to the book of Exodus. Ah, oh, Scott, come on. I'm guessing it has to be where Moses Exodus is. 34. <laughs> yep. Face was bright as the sun, kind of. You got it. Radiant would be a good yes. word. Verse, chapter 34, verse 29. I'm reading from my notes and trying to put the correct thing in my iPad yes. here. Radiant is the word. Radiant yeah, is the like word. Glowing. Yeah, the, my, my little subheading in the NIV is the radiant face of Moses. So, just to explain what's happened, Moses has gone up on the mountaintop. He got the stone tablets. Forty days has passed. He's come down the mountain and discovered that the people have made that stupid golden calf. 
Moses and some of them men went through and they slaughtered a lot of people who made that golden calf. And God has told Moses, no, I'm not going on with you guys. But Moses persuades God to go on and, in, and indeed God reveals himself to Moses up there on the mountaintop. And God tells Moses to make a second set of tablets. And now he's coming down with that second set. Verse 29 of Exodus 34. So it's Exodus 34, verse 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, these are the new tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with Yahweh. So this is like, <laughs> what is it like? It's like getting a sunburn, maybe, from the glory of God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to Moses and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him. And he gave them all the commands Yahweh had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. That's so that they're not, he's just kind of like hiding that, that radiance from them. Okay? But whenever he entered Yahweh's presence to speak with him, this was what would happen in the tent of meeting um, after they build the tabernacle. He removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with Yahweh. So the glory of the Lord is so immense that Moses' face is rendered radiant. And he comes out radiant and, and he uses a veil to sort of suppress that bright radiance and then removes it when he's going to speak to God and then puts the veil back, you know? And look at, look at, as long as we're here, look at Exodus chapter 40 at the very end. Because this is, this is not the passage, it's very clear the passage, the exact passage Paul is referring to is the one we just read. But if you look at chapter 40, the very last paragraphs. So, verse 34, for Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That's it. The glory of the Lord makes Moses' face so radiant, he frightened everybody. And now the glory of the Lord is so immense that it fills the tent and Moses can't even get in the door. Those are the kind of things that, that Paul is talking about here. So now, go back to 2 Corinthians. <laughs> We're getting a workout today. Yeah. Our Chapter 3. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, something, I guess. Yeah, this is, I'm not getting steps for this, no, am no I? No steps for this. Back to 3. 2 Corinthians. Go to, tab, go to verse 7. I know all this setup might seem a little bit lengthy, but it's it's gonna make I'm gonna you're gonna understand why I did all this. It's it's dot connecting. Indeed, Patty, we are connecting dots. And and if you don't if you don't know this story of the radiant face of Moses and the veiling what what you would read here, like if you were reading through the Bible for a year, you know and you just kind of came to this, yeah, you'd read it. Well, okay, that that's nice. But the power of it, you would miss. And Paul writes with power. So, verse 7. Now, with the ministry that brought death, 
the law of Moses, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, right? We know that it came with glory because Moses' face was radiant, right? So that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of his glory, because of its glory, transitory though it was, meaning it didn't last, it was like a sunburn, it lasted for a while, but it doesn't last all the all the way through. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? There is the old, there is the new. There is the radiant glory, radiant glory of Moses' face, but now there is the glory, gloriousness of the ministry of the Spirit. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, that's the law. How much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? Because in Christ we are made right with God. We are declared righteous. We are declared in the right. Like in a courtroom. You want to be in the wrong or do you want to be in the right? We want to be in the right. <laughs> if we're ever in the courtroom, we want to be declared in the right. And by being declared in the right, we are put back into a right relationship with God. Our relationship with God is rectified, to use an old word. It's rectified. Our relationship is rectified. It's back in the right place. It's back proper. It's back as it was before the humans threw it away in the Garden of Eden. How much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? So you see, he's just, he's talking about the old and he's talking about the new. The old, the new. Verse 10, for what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. It is it is like Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews, you know, we don't need a high priest anymore. We They were great, but we don't need a high priest anymore. We have Jesus. How you can have a high priest better than Jesus? We don't need those sacrifices anymore. Why we have the sacrifice made by Jesus himself? We don't. How can we do better than that? We don't need any of that old stuff. It isn't that it was bad. It just has outlived its day. And the truth is, it condemned humanity, condemned people to perish apart from God. And what could be worse? They needed, they needed, what, what, what did humanity need? Humanity needed a savior not a list of rules which they can't keep. That's the essence of it. And that Savior's name is Jesus. Verse 10 again. For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. Just mentally put in your head a piece of paper with two sides on it. The old and the new. Verse 11. And if what was transitory came with glory. That's the law. The law was transitory. How much greater is the glory of that which lasts? And that is the Spirit, the ministry of the Spirit, the reconciliation brought by Christ. Impermanent, permanent. Old, new. Transitory, forever. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Everlasting life. Gosh, God, I can't help but wonder. Mm -hmm. We are 2,000 years later. We've been blessed with ministries, Bible studies, you know, go into church that's in, in our language. We understand difficult was it for these people to understand all this how much how many of them really understood what he was saying well for some I suspect it was a big mountain decline if you were a Jewish Christian 
this would be much easier to understand because they knew their Old Testament the way you and I wouldn't. As soon as Paul drops a phrase about, you know, law written on the tablets of stone versus the heart, they would instantly go to Ezekiel. They would instantly go to the scroll of Jeremiah. They knew the story of the Moses radiant face without having to open a scroll and read it. That's what they grew up with. For the Gentiles, whew, it's a little surprise, really, I think, that in the early church, we know that in the many Christian communities, people who wanted to, to join this movement yes. entered a three-year period of instruction, catechism, instruction, oh. at the end of which they were baptized, right? Because it is... And what else makes this hard, Patty? Part of what makes this hard is this: this works against the way we want it to work. We want to be the ones who choose everything. We want to be the ones in control. We want it to depend on everything we do. I want to pick myself up by the bootstrap. So when Paul says, it's not about me, it's about God, that's where the competency comes from. That, that rubs a lot of people the wrong way. You know, I think. So, verse 12. Therefore, and this is after this preceding paragraph about the old glory, which was transitory and passing against the new glory. Eternity in Christ with God. Verse 12. Therefore, since we have such a hope, that is the hope we have in Christ. We are very bold. Paul is talking about himself, but he is certainly talking about you and me as well. We are very bold. We should be very bold. We can be very bold, confident. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. So, what Paul says is that what was happening was he would come back with his face all radiant, you know, kind of like, quote, quote, sunburn, and he used the veil because it hid the fact that it was slowly going away. Until he went back and saw God again, took the veil off, got re-radiated. <laughs> That's not even a word, of course. <laughs> right? And then came back and put the veil over it to hide from the people the fact that this, this radiance was transitory. Now, I don't think there's a particular place in the Old Testament that, that says that, but, you know, Paul is Paul. So, and as well, this whole veiling of Moses' face is something that I don't think is referred to again in the story of the Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So anyway, verse 13, we are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. What does he mean? Who is he speaking of? He's speaking of his fellow Jews whose minds and hearts are veiled when they read the scriptures, such that though they read the scroll of Isaiah, chapter 53, they don't actually have chapters, but you know what I mean. Yes, yes. The suffering servant. They don't see, see Jesus. Jesus in yes. it. Exactly, Patty. Why mm -hmm. don't... You know, I'm asked, how many times have I asked by people... Well, why don't they see Jesus in Isaiah 53? Why don't they understand? Why don't they read these Hebrew scriptures the way we Christians do in light of Jesus? And Paul says, Their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. If you want to read the scriptures well and correctly, 
you, it is in and through Christ. This is the key part of what the Christian understanding is of our community, that we are a community formed by the Spirit, and that when we come together to read Scripture, it is the Holy Spirit who will guide us and illuminate for us what's on, what's on the page. It's not magic, but it is as if a veil is taken away from the page, and we can see more clearly, and we can enter into conversations with 2,000 years worth of Christians who came before us with all of their writings and their ideas and with one another and with our fellow Christians from Nigeria to Korea, and we are all in this conversation that is being led by the Spirit. But if you are not in Christ... You're just not going to read it the same way. That is my observation after going to several of these big biblical conferences. There are a lot of people there who, who they know their Bible stuff, but they just, they just don't seem to really get it. And they get mad about the wrong things. And I think of this passage. It is, the veil has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. So again, two groups. Those in Christ and those who are not. Right? Yes. Those in the light, those in the darkness. Those who have put their faith in Jesus and those who have not. That's it. Two groups. It came up in a conversation the other day. Are there such a thing as anonymous Christians? Now, the phrase anonymous Christians has a history to it. It is The idea is that there are people out there who are so kind and loving to another person that they're a Christian without even knowing it. And I say to that, balderdash. Balderdash. That is not the biblical understanding of what is happening here. You can't be a Christian and not have put your faith in Christ. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that you are extra nice to people or extra kind to people or you're an especially good person. That's not what in view here because nobody is kind enough. Nobody is good enough. Nobody should fool themselves into thinking that about their own hearts. It's just that their targets are different. No. The biblical view, New Testament, from beginning to end. John's gospel is equally as strong in this as this paragraph right here. You are in Christ or you are not. No middle of the road, no sitting on the fence. Nope, nope, you are in Christ, you are in Christ or you are not. Because only in Christ is the veil taken away. No learning, no education, none of that. Seminary won't do that. PhDs won't do that. It comes from putting your faith in Christ, which is a gift given to all, though many walk away. Verse 15, even to this day, Paul writes, when Moses is read, when he means when the law of Moses, let's just say the book of Leviticus is read, a veil covers their hearts. In the NRSV, I think they use the word minds, but it actually in the Greek, it's cardia. Covers their hearts. I like the heart word better. Covers their hearts because faith is a heart word. It's not an intellectual assent to certain doctrines. Faith, pistis, is a heart word. It's, a, it's trust. Whenever anyone turns... For, verse 15, let me go back to there. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. These are his fellow Jews. His heart breaks for them. Read Romans 9, 10, and 11. His heart breaks for them. He goes to them first thing every place Paul, do, Paul does. He goes first thing to the synagogues. He wants his fellow Jews to embrace their Messiah. 
but most are not. Most are not. Lynn put a comment there, and she said, well, like we were just talking about, the Jews were looking for a powerful military leader to free them, and they just could not see that Jesus was the Messiah. It, it, it's, it's the Gentile equivalent. I, it's a phrase I heard from Ben Witherington. How silly a God to get himself crucified. Right? No, just go away. That can't be. Jesus was crucified. No, go away. Go away, Paul. Mm -mm. One thing that I yeah. take away from all of this, and all because this is a big lesson of connecting the dots, is just how important it is for us as Christians to not leave out the Old Testament. I know many people, and this was me included for a very long time, you only want to hear the good stuff. You know, you want to hear the New, New Testament, the stuff about Jesus. And if you were lucky to be brought up in a Christian home, you never had to make that leap right. of faith like the right. Jews did. But I don't know. This shows me that, you know, thousands and thousands of years this plan was in, in the works until it all came through with Jesus. Right? Yes, and, and you are. Because so many of those Old Testament stories you would read, and I would, I mean, go into Catholic school and you'd read it and you kind of go like, what does this have to do with me? And I never had anybody be able to make the connections to me, you know. None, the nuns probably couldn't. Not at all. They were probably not educated in a way where they could where they could do that. Um, I wonder afterwards, like, well, really, as a kid, like, what do I need to know about Jeremiah? Remember, remember the movie we saw in education where the principal yes. of the school told this girl, when the girl said, well, you know, Jesus was Jewish, she got suspended from school for saying such such a crazy thing. Yes, how silly right? that was. So yeah, but here we are at St. Andrew and we are we are trying to become better disciples in part by becoming better readers of scripture, taking it in, understanding it in, and that requires requires um, the Old Testament. Because just the New Testament is so dependent on it. This whole prayer, how much sense would this does, does it, do these paragraphs we're reading here make if you don't know what the story of Moses and the radiant face is? So, all right. Whew. Verse 16, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. You know, I read that. I don't think that Paul has this in mind. But I can't help but think about the curtain veil in Mark, right? That when Jesus dies, the veil in the the curtain in the temple is torn in two. I, I don't think that's what it's clear Paul is working from the the Moses story with the veil and the radiant glory. But verse anyway, verse seventeen. Now the Lord is the Spirit. Right? This is this is this monotheistic. Trinitarian claim. I mean, this is where the Trinity comes from, are these kind of little sentences. Now the Lord, that's Jesus, is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Oh, gosh. Freedom from what? Freedom from... Freedom from divisions, freedom from sin, freedom from death, freedom from mourning and tears. It is, it is, Christ brings the great reversal. And the things that plague us now will not plague us forever. Because in the spirit of the Lord, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. God is freeing us from, from the shackles that we want to put on ourselves and we want to put on others. And it's a very, very regrettable thing when Christians somehow convince themselves that their job is to create new shackles for people. Right? New shackles for people. And... It's, it's, it's just a failure to really grasp 
the enormity of God's grace and the enormity of freedom that is created by that grace. So, verse 17, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled voices, faces, not voices, faces, and we all, who with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory, or, I don't know what translation you have, contemplate, look upon the Lord's glory, reflect the Lord's glory. There are different ways the Greek could be translated there, but we all who with unveiled for faces look upon, reflect, contemplate the Lord's glory, we are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Whoa. You know, I use the word, actually, not just me, but Christian teachers in general and pastors and preachers will use the word Christ-likeness. That we are to grow to become more like Christ. We had a sermon a few weeks ago on engaging the cruciform, right, cross-shaped life, which is one small step from Christ likeness. We are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So, all of Paul's calls to be kind and compassionate, to simply understand what love is be ready to pour it out on others in very, very practical ways. Those are all ways in which we are being increasingly transformed into the image of Jesus, Christ-like. It doesn't mean we're Jesus. We're not divine. There's no spark of divinity in us or something like that. But we can learn in practice loving God and loving others better every day. And we should never settle for less. should never settle for less. And so verse 18 is packs a punch too. And we all, who with unfailed voices, faces, why do I keep saying voices? I think it's because of the Vs. And we all, who with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the spirit we are being transformed in Romans 12 Paul writes be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you will know what the will of God is so you will know what is pleasing and good and mature be transformed um, Paul tells people, you know, I have to give you milk now. I want to give you meat. You're like little bitty boats being blown hither and yon on a pond. You need to grow up. You need to be, you need to be better. It's like, you know, some, I hear a lot of things said, you know, in our culture today, and I guess they've been around forever, you know, doesn't God just love me as I am? Well, of course God loves you as you are, but he wants you to be better. And he's making you better. Just quit fighting it all the time. Just listen to him and be better. Be kinder, more compassionate, more gentle, more patient, Scott. Um, that's, that's who we're called to be. You can't, you can't ever get complacent and just settle in and, and stop. And just say, well, gosh, I guess we're done. I, I just don't think that's how it is. So, wow, I invite you, because I think it must be getting close. Yeah. It is. I invite you this week to go back through this passage. Maybe read the Moses passage again in Exodus 34. And just see this stark 
contrast that Paul is drawing between the old and the new. Because we are the people of the new covenant. Paul is a minister of the new covenant. And it is the covenant that gives life. So when we come back next week, we will pick up right there in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. That's right. So, Patty, lots of, lots of Old Testament stuff today, huh? Yes. Yeah, yes. it's, it's good. good. It's it is good. good. Yep, good to tie it together. And I have to tell you, using my iPad and using the U version <laughs> really helps going back and forth between those. If any of well, you are I, looking for a good Mine's real Bible, easy. I just keep, I just have yes. fat fingers and I can't see most oh, I know, of it. But I'm know. saying if you struggle sometimes in the Bible to turn to get to the right section that Scott's jumping us to, the version that's called you, Y-O-U version, um, we both have that on our phones and, and on our iPads and stuff. Um, I find it to be very good. It will also allow you to download almost any version of the Bible. I've got three or four on mine. So sometimes when we read a line of scripture, I quickly will turn it over to the Common English Bible or NRSV or something else and just, just see the, the slight subtle differences between the two. And you can down, and, and a lot of what it offers is free. Yes. Sometimes yes. the translations you have to pay something for. But and, and it is also that it, it is... Um, it does have audio, so you can actually, at the bottom, hit the button. Every once in a while, you'll see that I mess up, and that's what I do. I hit the button, and the scripture actually comes alive and right in the middle of class. <laughs> so. so I bet that our audio reader would say, with unveiled faces instead of voices, in verse 18, huh? Yes. 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 Well, anyway, there we go. <laughs> anyway. We hope to see you at St. Andrew this week. Of course, class is tomorrow as we work our way through Acts. And then um, Thursday, Friday will be big days yeah, at St. Andrew. Monday, Thursday, Andrew. Good Friday. Yes. Be there for all of it. It's just what we, you want to grow in your faith? Yeah. Come to Monday, Thursday. Come to Good Friday. Don't just go from Palm Sunday to Easter. That's right. That's right. That's right. And Lauren will be preaching Thursday night. She will be. And I know she is. And we'll, um, and we'll be sharing communion. hard on that. Yes, we all get to share communion on the night that... Jesus, the we night, remember the, the that night Jesus, of the Last Supper. Right, that he introduced that whole uh, way of keeping him. Right. You know, remembering him. Let's go to God in prayer as we close out today. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time for us to get together on Monday afternoons. We thank you, God, for Scott's teaching. Lord, we thank you most of all for your word, for this word, God, that you have left for us. And we just pray, God, that you would open our eyes and our hearts to the message, God, that you want us to understand and to take away from this lesson, God, and, and all, the, all the lessons, God, that we go to where we're studying your word. We pray, dear God, that you would keep us faithful this week. We pray that you'd watch over us, Lord, and we pray for your wisdom and your discernment in our lives. And, Lord, we just pray that um, you will... You know, we'd really feel your presence as we walk alongside you, God, in the, towards the end of our week as we make our way up to Good Friday and then the joy on Easter morning. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Adios, everybody. Bye, friends. See some of you tomorrow. Bye.